Welcome. You're listening to The Aligned Self, conversations in creating a conscious and abundant life. This is Daniel DeNovi. I'll be your guide and host. Let's see just where we can take this. Hello, friend, and welcome back to the conversation. And I realize some of you are coming into this conversation for the first time. You may not know exactly who I am. My name is Daniel DeNovi. I am a coach, peak performance coach, a master life and business coach. And I've been happily engaged in the coaching profession for over 30 years. In fact, I was a coach before coaching was actually called coaching. In the early days, I billed myself as a hypnotherapist and NLP practitioner. A lot of people didn't know what NLP was, Neuro Linguistic Programming. So I didn't talk about the specific things I did. I talked about the results I could get people. At the moment, I'm currently working with about 20 clients. About 15 of these clients are in my group coaching program, and then five one-on-one clients. And I always find it interesting that there is a common theme where group consciousness, and you end up working with me, you're part of an ongoing conversation that not only involves me, but other people that I work with, just as a matter of course of being in tune or in touch or connected to the universe. And so, like I was saying, I always find it interesting when there is a common theme that comes up among two or more members, because it's typically coming up for just about everybody. And one question that has come to the forefront recently is this whole idea of how do I listen to the universe? How do I tune into my intuition? How do I know it's really my intuition? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about today. How to receive guidance from the universe. First and foremost, everyone has access to the messages of the universe. Everyone has access to intuition. It's part of your birthright as a human being. It's part of the tools in your survival skills toolbox. Yet most people have been conditioned not to listen, not to pay attention, to ignore their inner signals, to utilize their rational mind. Now there is a place for rational thought, rational consideration, practicality. But by and large, your intuition plays a much bigger role. And when you can learn to balance the two and and engage both your rational mind and your intuitive guidance, and default, I guess if you come to a stalemate, you default to your intuition, you're going to have a life that unfolds like magic. I like to say if you can listen to the guidance when it's a whisper, then your life will unfold like magic. Most people wait until it's a screaming message from the universe before they take action or begin listening. By that time, your life is usually in a circumstance of struggle and effort and dismay. You don't like what you've created through your decisions because most of the time you're not listening to your intuition, but you've created these structures, these relationships, these careers, these institutions in your life. And what happens is when they begin to fall away, they begin to crumble. That's when we make the big decisions. That's when we leave the career. That's when we leave the relationship. That's when we like take a different approach. And we can look back on three, four, five years, maybe even 20 years earlier. And you can say, part of me knew this wasn't going to work out, which is easy to acknowledge in hindsight. But when you were way back in there 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, and you had that feeling, you downplayed it, you ignored it. Because at the time, it seemed like if you were to listen to that still small voice, that little inkling inside and give it actual credibility, that you would lose out. You'd lose the relationship. You'd lose the love. You'd, there's, a, there's an experience, and this is the experience of the ego or a fragile ego. In listening to our intuition, it seems like we're going to be going astray or we're not really going to get what we want. The other thing that we deal with is that if we trust our intuitive guidance, we are going to step into the unknown because we don't necessarily know what's around the corner. Sometimes we we acquiesce or we give in to what we currently have because it's familiar, even though it's not really satisfying or it's fulfilling. And so in the beginning, sometimes following your intuition requires courage, blind faith, As you get practiced in following your intuition, you have more confidence in that inner feeling, that inner knowing, and you can take actions much quicker, much faster than you ever could before. You don't have to wait till things are falling apart until you actually step into the path that you're supposed to be on. 
This was me in my 20s, my early 20s to late 20s. I was making decisions based on a fragile ego. But then when I was 27, 28, I made a decision that changed my life. I was inspirationally dissatisfied with the way things were. And I was reflecting a couple days ago, what happened? What brought that to bear? What information was I exposed to that made me think about things in a different way? And then it popped in my head. It was actually a story that Wayne Dyer told about the critical inch. He said most people create their life doing the things that they feel are expected from them, what other people want from them, the acceptable path. And then one day they might get a diagnosis. Maybe it's a death sentence. They're going to die within the next three years. And then suddenly, with the realization that they only have three years left of their life, they start making critical decisions, different decisions. They might quit their job. They might leave their relationship. They might travel the world. They might... They start doing things that are differently. They're operating from their inner signals. They're operating from their heart. It's the critical inch. It's the last inch of their life. And up until that time, their life was misdirected. They weren't living their life from their own inner signals. They were not inner directed. They were externally directed. See, we seek the attention. We seek the acceptance of all these people around us when ultimately they are not living our life. There was actually a movie that depicted this. Uh, it was not a good movie. It was with Tom Hanks, Joe versus the Volcano. And if you want, I'll give you a short synopsis here in my interpretation of it. Tom Hanks played a character, oh, Joe. He played the character Joe, and he was working in a factory. It was drill work, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three. Same routine day in, day out, and it was very dreary. The whole atmosphere of the movie is dreary. Well, he ends up getting a diagnosis from a doctor and says he's going to die. His doctor suggests that he should arrange his affairs, get his affairs in order to arrange his life to live out his last few days with joy and satisfaction because his days are numbered. Faced with his mortality, he now quits his job immediately. He cashes in all his bonds, he withdraws all the money out of his bank account, and he buys a huge traveling trunk and decides to travel the world. He begins operating his life totally from inspired action, intuition. And what transpires is a series of synchronous events. The universe begins conspiring on his behalf because he is living from his heart, living from his intuition. And so here's a spoiler alert. I mean, it's an old movie, so it doesn't really matter. It's still somewhat enjoyable, although not really good. But Joe ends up on a Pacific island, and there's a volcano about ready to erupt. And the tribe there is going to give a human sacrifice to appease the volcano god. And Joe figures, hey, I'm going to die anyways. Why don't I volunteer to be the sacrifice? He makes his way up to the mouth of the volcano, looks into the fiery pit, and takes a leap of faith. And when he jumps, the volcano erupts and catapults him out to sea with his big traveling trunk. The moral of the story is when you take the leap of faith, you are delivered by unseen forces. This is where I'm going to share a quote from Henry David Thoreau. If one advances confidently in the direction of his or her dreams and endeavors to live the life in which he or she has imagined, they will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. They will put some things behind, will pass an invisible boundary. New universal, more liberal laws will begin to establish themselves around and within them, or the old laws will be expanded and interpreted in their favor in a more liberal sense, and they will live with a license of a higher order of beings." Most often you just hear this first part of this quote. If one advances confidently in the direction of their dreams and endeavors to live the life in which they have imagined, they will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. And what that means, it's beyond rational thought, common thinking, common sense. It's as if miracles appear in their life. Now we're going to get into the actual podcast. I, I guess I needed that setup. I want to talk about how to interpret the messages from the universe and talk about some of the misconceptions that get in the way of you actually tuning in to your intuitive guidance. Now, if this is an area that's profoundly interesting to you, I do have a course called the Intuition Course. 
That's available in the Nexus membership, and the link is going to be in the show notes. But there, you actually have access to my 30 years of development, psychic development, intuitive development, where I've done a lot of the heavy lifting, and I can guide you in some very specific ways to access your intuition much faster than you can do on your own. And not only access it, but learn to trust it. That's essentially the key component of intuition. You see, the universe is always communicating to you. You have guidance that is always around you each and every moment of every day. You can access intuitive guidance. Most people think of it as some special connection, but it's really just tuning in to the 10,000 whispers that are there each and every day for you, for your benefit, answering your questions. So I guess the first misconception about intuition is that it's something special. It's something you have access to. It is your God-given right, your God-given skill. It's the first thing that you have access to. Psychic Sonia Coquette said that when she was brought up, she was taught to trust her vibes by her mom, who was very psychic herself. But that was always the question. What do your vibes say? Tune into your vibes. And she said that her mother always taught her that her vibes were her sixth sense, and her sixth sense was the first sense. The next thing to realize about your inner guidance is that it just doesn't come from within you. It comes from your higher self. It comes from other aspects of consciousness, not just your own local consciousness. You see, you have access to local information, meaning that it's your own personal history, your subconscious, knowledge that you have from your lifetime. You can access that database, and it's going to show up as an intuitive hit, an intuitive sensation, somewhere along the midline of your body. So if you draw a line between your belly button and your throat, that sensation is going to occur somewhere along that midline. That's typically referred to as clairsentient information or feeling information, an inner knowing. A knowing without knowing how you know. Now that distinction was very important to me because I often felt like I needed to know where this information was coming from. But then I would get these sensations, these knowings, and I didn't know where it was coming from, and I began trusting it, acting as if that is intuitive guidance, and then seeing how things would play out. And then I would look back in retrospect. How did it play out? Did it play out for my benefit? Was it beneficial? Did it lead me down a, a detour or a wrong road? By tuning in to what was that sensation, where was it in my body? What was the quality of that sensation? In hindsight, I began tuning in or calibrating to what was my inner signals. Specifically, what was a yes and what was a no? How did a no feel and how did a yes feel? How did it feel when it was right and how did it feel when it was wrong? tuning into those inner sensations. Now that does take a certain amount of self-reflection, which I used to think that a lot of people or everyone had access to, but it's a skill. Tuning into your own inner signals. What does it feel like? Now I did introduce the concept of local information, but there's also non-local information, which can be considered the universal mind, supreme intelligence, God got us all that is, or your higher self. Now, your higher self is your spiritual aspect or your soul aspect. It's also been referred to as the oversoul of the inner being. But they all talk about the same thing, which is that aspect of you that has one foot in your life and one foot in the divine. It bridges the gap between your material experience or your 3D experience and God, God is all that is, the infinite. You could think of the non-local information as cloud computing. You just save it up to the cloud or you access the cloud and download the information that you need. This is why I frequently refer to our mind as being our conscious mind and our other than conscious, which includes your subconscious mind, your unconscious processing and super consciousness or the universal mind, creative intelligence. So let's recap quickly. Everyone has access to intuitive guidance. The universe is always talking to you always communicating, always sharing insights. It's just you tuning in, learning to tune in. So how do we begin tuning in to the messages of the universe? First is making an assessment of what is my current question. You see, the universe is always responding to your current question, your current inquiry, your current focus. This is law of attraction. You see, if you ask a question of God and expect an answer, you get 
the answer. The universe will always tell you an answer. It may not be in the form that you think it is. And this is one of the problems that people, my clients most recently, have had an issue with, that they were sitting there thinking that the information was going to come through like angels singing or a beam of light coming down from the heavens. But in actuality, is typically a still, small voice. When I say still, there's not a lot of emotion behind it. It's a voice that shows up that's kind of even keel, matter of fact. Now, for me, I hear that voice just behind my left ear. It has a location attached to it. That's one of the ways I know that it's intuitive guidance. And it's typically a small voice. It doesn't make a big deal. It's like the 10,000 whispers. So I have some examples of how this occurs in my life. The last podcast episode was entitled, I Quantum Jumped Yesterday. Now, I understand that quantum jumping and multiple timelines and parallel universes is kind of a far stretch for some people to wrap their head around, but I'm going to go in depth in the next episode around all this. So as I was reflecting on it, did I have any proof that I had shifted a timeline? This was my inquiry. This was my question. Were there any other indicators in my experience that indicated that, you know, time was shifting or I was shifting on a new reality? Well, four things happened. Four messages from the universe, and I'm going to talk about all four of them. First, quote-unquote, I found a tool that had been lost. It had been lost for like three months. I've torn the garage apart. I've gone through all my toolboxes. I went through the... Everywhere I could think of to look for this tool, I looked and could not find it. I was sure it was lost. Or maybe someone had taken it. Well, I went outside that morning, and the tool was sitting by the back door. I asked my sons. No one knew anything about it. Asked my wife. No one had seen it. They don't know where it came from. The other interesting thing that happened was I had spilled coffee on a book, and I had to throw the book away because it was saturated. It was, it was, it was horrible. And I was, so, I, I, <laughs> I was so disappointed in myself. But later in the day, after I asked that question in the morning, I was sitting in my chair in my office. I looked over the bookshelf, and that book was in the bookshelf. Pristine, perfect. So whatever timeline I was in now, the coffee spill never occurred. Situation number three, I prepared myself a cup of coffee. I like to do the bulletproof coffee, add a little coconut oil to it. I don't do the butter, but I was going to add some almond milk to it. I open up the fridge and there's no almond milk. At the time, I was the only one up in the house. So I get my shoes down and I go to the store to get some almond milk. I come back, add it to my coffee and I take it up to my office. Not one minute after I sat down, I get a text because the door to my office was closed, so my family knows that if I'm in my office, the way they communicate with me is via text. Well, my son sent me a text and said, did you take my coffee? I said, no, I took my coffee. He said, well, my coffee disappeared. Intrigued, I went downstairs to talk to him some more. He said he poured himself a cup of coffee, opened up the fridge and realized there was no almond milk and went to the store and bought some almond milk. And we were like two ships passing the night. Evidently, he, I didn't even know he was up when I was preparing my cup of coffee. I said, hmm, I think I might have created a glitch in the matrix. The next thing that happened on my way to the gym in the morning at 6 a.m. the next day, I got a warning on my dashboard that said I was losing tire pressure and it was one of the rear tires, one of the new tires that I had bought just recently. So I pull into the parking lot and I get out to go into the gym and I can hear this. I had picked up a piece of metal and it was embedded in the tire. Well, it was early, it was still dark out and so I decided to go in and work out and I would change it once I was done because I'm a man and I know how to do those things. So I come out and start changing it, and I realize that the lug nuts are on so tight that I can't use the tool that comes with a car in order to take it off, and I have to go home or have someone come pick me up to get the tool that I have in my garage that was not in my car, the lug wrench, that would actually do the work. I could get enough leverage on it. The one that came with a car was a cheap piece of metal that, you know, not the highest quality. Well, I texted and I called and no one was up yet at home because I went to the gym before anyone was up and I was done working out before anyone was up. So it was another hour or so, hour and a half until someone was up, my wife was up so she could come get me to go back to get my tool and I could turn around and come back. But while I was waiting there, I thought I might as well just call road service. They can change the tire and I won't even have to worry about it. But no, 
My man ego inside said, I can fix it. It's not that big a deal. I know how to do this. Yada, yada, yada. And again, when I was on the phone with my wife, she said, why don't you call road service? I say, I just need to change a tire. I have the wrench at home. And I, you know, I could feel my man ego. I can do this. That that part of my subpersonality, I can do this on my own, <laughs> come up. And I could reflexive, like I could actually, the third person, the witness position, I could see myself thinking these thoughts, feeling this feeling, and not wanting to call a tow truck, which probably would have been quicker. So by the time I got back to the car, got the tire changed, it had been five hours since I first discovered the flat. I was able to take it back to the shop, which I had road hazard service on it, and they replaced the tire for free, which is good. So it didn't cost me any money. And my wife asked me, how did I create this? And believe me, I was thinking the very same thing before she ever asked me, how did I create this? What's the lesson in this? Where, what am I supposed to learn? Well, it hit me when I was in the middle of changing my tire. I should have used road service. I didn't need to do this myself. It would have been so much quicker. It would have been so much easier. I just needed to put my ego aside. And so I asked myself the question, where else in my life am I taking on tasks, doing things that I can delegate to others, but I'm not because my ego is in the way? Well, I had a list of about 10 different items that I can start handing off right away. Some of these things are home maintenance items because I was brought up by a father who could fix anything. We redid our entire house. I was brought up with a tool in my hand. I can throw a hammer just as well as Bob Vila can any day of the week. And if you don't know who Bob Vila was, he was the host of This Old House on PBS. And they would renovate old houses. But I realized I have this thing where I can fix it myself. I've fixed the furnace three times, each time saving about $300. I've fixed the air conditioning. I've rebuilt my pool pump. See, I do all these things because I can, not necessarily because I should. There is some satisfaction that is massaged by my father of the money that I'm saving in doing it myself. What I'm not aware of, though, what I'm not present to is the cost in time. Now, six months ago, I decided to create an exponential life. What if I was to 10x my results? What would that take? What would that involve? Well, I realized that in this new timeline that I'm on, I was brought front and center with the knowing that I'm wasting some of my energy, I'm wasting some of my time doing things that other people can do. So that's a long story to say that sometimes when things occur, it is the universe's way to communicate to us that there is a lesson involved that if we get it will take us to the next level, provide a deeper understanding or a greater awareness. Now, my wife is a fan of TikTok. And she has a relationship with TikTok that if she has a question she wants an answer to, she puts it out to the universe and she expects a TikTok video to show up in alignment with her inquiry or in alignment with her question. And it always does within a day to three days. I do the same thing with YouTube. In fact, because my mind has shifted so much since last August, almost a year ago, my algorithm in YouTube is completely different, totally different. Because what happens is I throw out a question and a video pops up and I follow that thread like a rabbit down a rabbit hole. Following that rabbit is following your intuition. Sometimes it feels like a waste of time, but you never ever know completely when you start following that rabbit where you're going to end up. Other ways that the universe communicates to you is sometimes through a song on the radio. It might come on the moment you get in the car might be a recurring song that comes on the radio every time you get in the car or frequently. Now, if there's a pop song that's popular, that sounds redundant, but if there's a popular song at the time and it's usually within the top 10 or top 50, they're going to play those on a secular basis every hour or two. But what you want to notice is the synchronicity, the coincidence, the coinciding of events when you sit in the car or you're traveling somewhere. And what are you thinking at the moment that song pops on. Sometimes you even hear that song in your head before it comes on. Sometimes I hear songs as I'm waking up in, those, in that twilight moment between sleep and wakefulness. 
And then it's also, what are you dreaming? What dreams pop up? When we assess our dreams, what is the theme? What's the emotional tone? Is that akin or similar to something else in your life? And you start to dissect it and look for a deeper meaning. And I'll go into a whole episode in the near future on interpreting your dreams. Now, what's important is when you ask for a sign, give me a sign. And sometimes people get a sign and they don't want to trust it. They don't feel comfortable yet. And they'll ask for another sign. And they'll ask for another sign. That points to a block within you that you have fear in trusting yourself. It's a practice. I get that it's a practice. And I get that it's, it's sometimes terrifying to trust yourself or trust this inner guidance because you don't necessarily know how you know, but you just seem to know it. So how can you really trust it? Well, you need to practice. And the way we practice is by doing things that have, I guess, a low impact on our life. It's not that dangerous if we follow this intuitive guidance. So what other ways is the universe communicating to us? Well, I pointed to it earlier through synchronicities, events that coincide in time and space to your benefit that are in alignment with the question or the answer that you're seeking. Now, I've come to a point in my life where I expect synchronicity. I expect it to show up. If it's not showing up, then I know that I'm not in alignment with the universe. I'm not plugged in. I'm efforting. I'm trying to go upstream. Because these synchronicities, when they occur, is essentially the universe saying, hey, you're on the right path. You're doing it. It's okay. Keep going. You're on the right road. Another thing that I'll do from time to time when I'm seeking an answer is I'll go to my bookshelf and I'll tune in. I'll look for a book that kind of jumps off the shelf for me that seems a little bit more illuminated, that is more sparkly or draws my attention. And this brings me to another point. Remember, the universe is always talking to you, always communicating. So at any point in time where you become aware of something in your environment or something in your experience, it kind of pops out or is a little bit more significant, a little bit more illuminated in your day-to-day -day experience. I take notice of that. And I usually say, isn't that interesting? Isn't that fascinating? I ask myself, is there a deeper meaning here? Is there a symbolic representation is there some story around this? What does this bring to mind? Because the universe communicates to you in a symbolic fashion. It doesn't always communicate in plain English. Let's say more often than not, it does not communicate directly or specifically. It's more symbolically. It's more metaphorically. So when you take notice, it begs a deeper question. I can remember when I was first introduced to the concept that the universe is always communicating to us. I was lying in a hammock and I began kind of just kind of absently mindedly, absent mindedly. I was just kind of staring off in a daze at a twig, a branch that had broken off a tree and it had dead leaves on it. And I had that little voice inside say, hey, you're looking at a branch. And then I began to wonder, what is the intuitive guidance here? Well, it's a branch that's broken off. It's dead. It's dying. What's currently dying in my life that I'm not aware of? Well, it was the relationship that I was currently in or kind of in that wasn't necessarily going the way I wanted to and what I was trying to make it work. And the branch was saying, just walk away. It's done. It's over. And so I did. And what's important is when I realized that when I said that to myself, there was a resonance inside of that is the answer. That's true. It felt right. It felt accurate. What other ways does the universe speak to you? It can be random conversations, random comments from strangers, random things you hear on the radio. Back in the late 90s, I decided to take an entire month off of work. And I was going to spend two weeks at home. And then the next two weeks, I was going to go on some kind of adventure. And I was thinking, wondering, where was I going to go? Where should I send my body? I thought, well, I could go to Florida and visit a friend there. I could go to Philadelphia. I have a friend there that I haven't seen in a while. I could, and at the time I was living in Michigan, and part of me even thought about camping in upper lower Michigan. I love the Sleeping Bear Dunes area, so I was thinking of sending myself up there. So I was in this inquiry, in this question, and here I am driving along, and a radio program called The Rest of the Story with Paul Harvey comes on. He, you know, does the news segment, and then he has a story. And he talked about a town that had the highest concentration of healers, psychics, and other metaphysical woo-woo stuff than any other place on the planet. 
and I got my attention. It sounded like, I want to go there. Where is this? Well, he said it was Sedona, Arizona. Well, this was pre-internet, so I wasn't able to research Sedona to a great extent. I had an idea what I was getting myself into. I knew that I wanted to I knew that I wanted to visit some of the energy centers, some of the vortexes, but other than that, I didn't really have any agenda. So I thought, wouldn't this be fun to turn this into a totally intuitive trip? I had a start and an end. I knew when I was going to get there. I knew how I was going to leave. I would fly into Vegas. I'd drive on down, and then I would drive back up to Vegas and fly out. Everything in between the beginning and the end was going to be intuitively arrived at, moment by moment, decision by decision, choice by choice. Well, that two-week trip ended up being one of the greatest trips of my life, where I really honed in my intuition, because I was totally listened to the inner signals. I was listening to any guidance that came my way, spirit animals, random directions, random conversations. I can remember the first night there, not having any reservations anywhere, trying to find a room, and all the rooms were booked. Every hotel I went to said, we have no rooms. The last hotel I visited said, well, there might be one next door. Evidently, there was some kind of convention in town, and and there was a lot more people in than normal. Or there was a snowstorm. That was it. There was a snowstorm up in Flagstaff, and so people weren't leaving. Well, anyways, I go to the hotel next door, and I hear them talking to a person at the counter saying, we don't have any rooms. And they walk out, and I confirm with them, are you saying there's no rooms available tonight? She said, no. She said to me, I think your best bet is to drive back up to Flagstaff and get a room up there. I said, I didn't really want to do that. Do you mind if I just sit down here in the lobby and try and figure out what my next step is? And the guidance that I got was just to meditate for five minutes, just to chill out, just to kind of receive what was going on. So I'm sitting there meditating, and then the phone rings, and I hear the woman answer it, the receptionist answer the phone. And she said, okay, I understand. Came back out to the counter, looked at me and said, sir, sir, we just had a cancellation. So I have a room if you want it. I'll take it. Well, that first day driving into Sedona, I ended up finding my way to Longington Canyon, and I spent the afternoon there meditating on an outcropping. And that's when I started looking for the hotel rooms, you know, only to find that last available one. The universe was guiding me. Why was that the last one? Why was I there at that time? Why did I pick that particular order of hotels? I must have gone to like seven of them. And I first picked one because it was an intuitively guided choice. But what it did is it led me to that last hotel at the precise time that someone was going to cancel their reservation. What's interesting is that hotel was actually closer to Longington Canyon than any other hotel. In fact, I drove by that to go to the first hotel, but there were no rooms then. It wasn't until 11 o'clock at night when I arrived back there when there was an opening. Well, the next morning, my plan was to go to the airport vortex. I turned on the main drag, and almost as soon as I made the turn onto the road, a raven flew right across the hood of my car, going in the opposite direction, back towards Longington Canyon. So what did I do? I followed the raven. That was where I was supposed to go. And I went back there, and I ended up going past Longington Canyon to Boynton Canyon and had the most extraordinary spiritual experience which I'm not going to talk about today. So hopefully there's some wisdom contained in this episode for you to access your own intuitive guidance, for you to glean some meaning from the way the universe is communicating to you on an ongoing basis, each and every day, each and every minute of every day, each and every second of each and every minute. And if you want to dive deeper into your own intuitive development, I suggest you join the Nexus and take part in the intuition course where you'll have access not only to the intuition course, but a number of other courses and trainings and audios that I have available there, as well as regular training and Q&A sessions inside the community. The link is in the show notes. So until next time, this is your friend and host, Daniel Danovi, urging you to follow your bliss. Live your life from inner signals. Be inner-directed as you engage in the epic adventure. (laughs) 